It is by the goodness of God that in our country we have those three unspeakably precious things. Freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, and the prudence never to practice either. <laughs> that was Mark Twain talking about uh, the American character, and I suspect uh, the humorist's view has uh, influenced a number of both cynics and idealists about the uh, course of American law, doctrine, and philosophy on the issue of freedom of speech. Uh, constitutional debate usually begins with some sort of discussion that asks the question, what did the framers think? And in this case, it'd be, what did the framers think about freedom of speech? If you are a lawyer in 1776 or 1788 or 1796, uh, you didn't have much law to read. Uh, except Blackstone and his commentaries on the law of England. And there he gave what is probably the central beginning point of American doctrine. The liberty of the press is indeed essential to the nature of a free state. But this consists in laying no previous restraint upon publications and not in freedom from censure for criminal matter when published. Every freeman has an undoubted right to lay what sentiments he pleases before the public. To forbid this is to destroy the freedom of the press. But if he publishes what is improper, mischievous, or illegal, he must take the consequences of his own temerity. Now you should understand, this is a very restrictive view of freedom of speech. It is not the modern conception. The fact is that while the framers did a lot of clear thinking about religious freedom, they didn't do much thinking about freedom of expression in a constitutional sense, even at the time when they adopted the First Amendment. They proved that in 1798 with uh, the Sedition Act uh, passed by Congress and signed by John Adams. Now, basically, that act said, if you criticize the government, the president, Congress, in a way that will bring them into public contempt, you can go to jail. Well, indeed, 10 men did, including one congressman. If applied today, you can imagine the number of people who'd be going to jail. The entire cast of Saturday Night Live. <laughs> Rush Limbaugh, John Stewart, all gone, poof, in prison. That's how limited our views were at the time. Now, the act expired on March 4th, 1801. That's Inauguration Day. It was passed by a Federalist Congress and was designed to expire as soon as the Federalist Congress would expire and someone else, some other party might be in power and might have to pass their own Sedition Act, which Jefferson did not do. The United States Supreme Court never ruled on the case. But Federalist courts, lower Federalist courts, I should say Federal courts that were then held by Federalist uh, appointees, upheld the law because it was not a prior restraint. And it seemed to comply with all the elements of a good liberal law, thought at the time. Now, this episode in American history gave birth to the philosophy, the doctrine, and many later academic writings about what freedom of speech meant. But it is not the original framer's understanding. It is, at best, an estimate of what Madison, in particular, came to believe. And the best evidence of that is his Report of 1800, which I recommend to you all as the single best document explaining freedom of expression in early American history. Now, I have to go through a lot of American history before I get to the principal foundation of freedom of speech today, which is the New York Times v. Sullivan case. Between the Sedition Act episode and the 1960s and the Warren Court, state government had primary responsibility for defining freedom of expression. The First Amendment did not apply to the state governments. 
until the Supreme Court said so in the 1920s. Even then, for a long time, the law primarily barred only prior restraint, just like Blackstone. The number of cases expanding freedom of speech through this period, the World War I period, was very minimal. Let me give you an example of how doctrine in World War I operated. A Vermont minister mimeographed the media of the day a statement that said, Christ prohibited his disciples from fighting for him on the eve of his crucifixion. This means that no good Christian can draw a sword on behalf of the city they dwell. Now he gave that to a number of other ministers, a couple of old men, and one young man of military age. He was prosecuted by the federal government, sentenced to jail for 15 years, this one piece of mimeographed paper, and he served for one. This is the doctrine in place in America during World War I, and this is the doctrine which inspires or provokes the famous dissents of Oliver Wendell Holmes, later Louis Brandeis, and ultimately the doctrines of the 1960s. Until the modern era, and that's well after 1937, the usual date for defining the modern era, hardly a word was heard from the court to protect a broader freedom of speech. It did not endorse anything remotely resembling Madison's theory of free speech until the Warren Court. Now the Warren Court is of course remembered for desegregation, reapportionment, the voting rights cases, for defining due process. It's also remembered and celebrated for giving us a modern construction of a theory of free expression. That case, step number one in understanding that uh, is New York Times v. Sullivan, which Professor Harry Calvin said contains the central meaning of the First Amendment. The facts are simple. A police commissioner sued the authors of a newspaper, the New York Times advertisement, and the New York Times itself for libel. They were concerned about an advertisement put into the paper by the allies of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The title was Heed Their Rising Voices. It described the heroic efforts of Dr. King and condemned uh, the southern strategies of repression trying to stop him. The problem was the advertisement was inaccurate in several particulars. They got some dates wrong. They got some details about the location of events wrong. Now there was no specific reference to Police Commissioner Sullivan, but it contained pretty hard criticism of the agency which he led. What was going on? Gene Roberts and Hank Klibanoff in their Pulitzer Prize winning history, The Race Beat, published in 2007, put it simply, if the officials could win, they would certainly silence the civil rights movement in Alabama, as well as the newspaper that consistently covered it. Silence, not money, was the goal. Alabama had some experience in forcing opposition off the playing field. The NAACP had been banned from doing business and had been wiped out a few years earlier, two more years before the ban would be lifted. If the defamation judgment of the Alabama courts I'm about to describe had been upheld, the New York Times would have been bankrupted in the 1960s. To achieve silence, Police Commissioner Sullivan turned to the law of Alabama. Now, as much as I'd like to say that Alabama was strange and uh, extreme, the truth is the law of libel used by Alabama was perfectly representative of all 50 jurisdictions. When the Supreme Court looks at this case, they're looking at defamation law that's in every law student's horn book and torts case book of the day. Critical publication was presumed to be defamatory. Falsity of the document is presumed. Malice is presumed. 
Now, everyone knows that Police Commissioner Sullivan suffered absolutely no decline in the esteem of his neighbors. Nevertheless, damage to his reputation was presumed, despite the fact he was heroically lionized as resisting Dr. King. It was unnecessary to show monetary loss. There was no defense except that the advertisement was true in every particular, and we know it wasn't. Good faith was irrelevant, could only mitigate punitive damages. So the New York Times had very little to say using the ordinary law of libel to prevent bankruptcy. The question before the United States Supreme Court was whether this law, dealing with public criticism of public officials in the performance of their duties, violated the First Amendment, which now did apply to the state governments by the process known as incorporation through the 14th Amendment. In a magnificent opinion by the Honorable William Brennan, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court struck down the defamation award and established new protections for citizens criticizing their leaders. Along the way, Justice Brennan made another, a number of important observations. One, falsehood, falsehood alone, is not enough of a reason to silence public debate. Falsehood, even to try to secure someone's reputation, was not a justification for trying to suppress public debate. And then even more boldly, because no court had gone here before, falsehood plus damage to reputation plus negligence, failure to check up on all the facts in the advertisement, was not enough to hold the New York Times responsible. The key, in Brennan's terms, was that the First Amendment represented a profound national commitment to the principle that debate on public issues should be uninhibited, robust, and wide open, and that such debate may well include vehement and caustic and sometimes unpleasantly sharp attacks on government and public officials. A footnote. The well-known, often discussed, often celebrated and criticized, Antoinette Scalia has, has said on at least three occasions that he thinks New York Times v. Sullivan was wrongly decided, even though he, Scalia, usually supports free speech cases, as he did in the Citizens United case. And in a sense, he's right. New York Times v. Sullivan is quite far removed from original understanding. So is Citizens United. So is his own opinion in City of St. Paul versus RAV, a hate speech case. In fact, the entirety of our First Amendment doctrine is far removed from original understanding, and Justice Scalia supports the bulk of it. If one compares the rationale offered by Justice Brennan and that Madison report I cited to you, uh, you'll find that Brennan relies heavily on the Madison Report, which contains virtually every libertarian premise and argument in favor of freedom of expression. One, we need to go beyond Blackstone. Blackstone does not define our liberties today. Two, and this is the central meaning, free speech is essential to democracy. The people's power to govern depends upon their ability to judge the merits and demerits of candidates and if incumbents can rig the game by preventing criticism of incumbents, the people's ability to govern by free choice is threatened. And on this point, truth as a defense is not enough. First of all, we're talking about sometimes very technical errors. It's the opinions, it's the philosophies, it's the doctrines that are often the objects of these prosecutions. So in my view, this opinion is consistent with some underlying principles 
the framers discovered in the first crisis over freedom of speech seven years after the ratification of the First Amendment. It also did three other things. As I said, it defined the central meaning of the First Amendment, but it also vindicated both liberty and equality. And most of all, finally, it protected the capacity of a people's union to search for what Mr. Lincoln called the better angels of our nature. This decision protected the ability of northern newspapers to go south and expose segregation for what it was. Thank you. Freedom 101 is made possible by generous support from the University of Oklahoma Alumni Association. Freedom 101 is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu.